Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It has been a long time. It's been an extremely long time. And this is season two of the Alex Steele Live Show, episode one. Formerly, the Alex Steele Live Show was hosted from Barker Street Forge in the United Kingdom with the help of our friend Sam. But now we are here in Montana. A long time later, a whole lot has happened in that time. Of course, you followed along as you probably watched some of the YouTube videos and things like that. But uh, yeah, a whole lot has changed. Here we are. We know a whole lot of you have been seeking some entertainment, and that's what we're going to aim to provide. It's the plan. We'll see if I can actually make that happen. What I have in the steel here, folks, is I have a piece of, what I have in the steel is a piece of fire. I have a piece of steel in the fire. It's a piece of 5 8 round, mild steel, I hope, because anything else would be a little bit too difficult to hammer on. I also have this, which is a piece of 4140, in case I want to make something else, too, while we're here. What are we going to do, you might be asking. Well, we're going to hammer on some hot steel with this beautiful anvil, and I think we're going to try and make a pair of tongs. Why would I make something as original as a pair of tongs? It's because I'm just extremely creative. That's a joke, in case you didn't get it. Making a pair of tongs is not very original. I've made a number of pairs of tongs, but what it is, is a really good opportunity for me to practice some skills that I haven't been able to practice in a while. You know, the nature of what I do on the day-to-day -day ends up being that I don't do a lot of hand forging, and so I want to try and brush up on those skills and bring you along the journey as we forge some hot steel and make a pair of tongs. So, thank you all so much for joining me. I have on my cellular device, comments from you very people who are watching right this very second. There's an unbelievable 3.7 thousand of you, which is just mind-blowing. It's more than we ever, ever had back when we were in the UK. So that's pretty crazy that, you know, first live show in a little while here, 3.7 thousand people. I'm thrilled that we have so many people here. We've got William Swink. We have Chris Lum. We've got Cody Ham, Andrew Brownscombe. Oh my goodness, there's so many people. Abby Cat, Callum Pritchard, Pedro. Joseph, Gladius, Chris. We got so many people, it is unbelievable. We've got a hot piece of steel though, and so the most important thing is for us to do a little less yak yak, a little more whack whack. It's time for us to do a one heat tongue blank on the end of this 5 8 round bar and see if I don't make too much of a mistake. Here we go. So the one heat tongue blank was popularized by Brian Brazil, who of course is where I picked up most of my forging knowledge. And uh, it's a brilliant technique, brilliant way of practicing forging, and also a really, of course, efficient way of forging pair of tongs. But it's been a long while since I've done this. Well, I say that. In one of the most recent videos that we posted, the most recent video that we posted, I actually forged half of a pair of tongs. So I'm not all the way out of practice. I did do this rough process a little bit, but I'm now live, which means I can't take another heat if I make a mistake. I've got to get it right. I'm also yapping way more than I should, which means I'm not focusing well. So I'll clean this up a little bit. The key thing with making a pair of tongs is just making sure that your pivot area is the thickest spot there. This is where the tongs are going to be pivoting. So what I'm trying to make sure is that this, which will become the reins, is thinner than the boss. So it wants to be a reverse taper back there. So there we go. That's the aim. There's the one heat tongue blank. Back in the fire we go. And uh, we'll keep chatting with you folks and seeing how you're doing. I will say, how I have this anvil set up, I've got a little bit, a little bit of a lot of radiant heat coming from the forge. So in a second, you might see that I push the forge away from myself. What you won't know, and I'm just going to say this to you guys only, because you know, if you're here watching the live stream, you're kind of in the club. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're in the club. You're, you're one of the cool kids. You're uh, you know, down with the vibes and the cool things and the hip secrets and such. So I will tell you this secret. My forge doors, my forge doors that may have taken three weeks to make, have broken and now do not work. So they are supported by bricks. And the irony is just something. You see that? Forged door supported by bricks. After all the effort we went through in making those forged doors, it's come full circle to them being supported by broken fire bricks again. So there we go. Don't let me code an Arduino for you 
because it's probably going to go faulty and it's going to end up being a bad time. So here we are. We're going to try and forge out the reins on this pair of tongs. I'm working over the far edge of the anvil, and this is just such fun. This is really, really fun because you don't usually swing the hand hammer. It is also a little more tiring than using a power hammer. So if I get out of breath, my excuse is only laziness and a lack of practice. I took one pass, and you see with every turn of the steel, I'm pulling it in further towards myself so that we can break that taper down. Steel is getting cold. It's getting hard to hit. And I'm getting weak in my old age. So I'm going to put it back in the fire and let it heat up just a little bit more. I've got ourselves one of these Amazon bandsaw thingmadoodle mozzits. Oh, I pinched my finger. I don't think I've ever experienced pain like that in my life. You pinched my finger under there. It was not a good time. Okay, okay. Let's let this heat up. Whew. I have to say and, and report back, running the forge off natural gas is glorious. It's so nice not having propane bottles here. So that's a really, really good time. That was expensive. But I've got a smile on my face. Now I'm thinking about it. So natural gas is going well for now. Oh my goodness. We have some people sending in super chats, sending in money. Thank you very much. That means a whole lot. It's very, very kind. So, Alec, please, for the love of God, make a mechanical forge door, says Aaron Flory. Now, Aaron, you sound like a reasonable man. Because that sounds like a very reasonable idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. It's just I'm not full of a whole lot of those, so mechanical forge doors is probably, probably the thing to do. <sighs> Back to the forging. In case you're curious, and because I want to show off how strong I am, despite how little forging I do, four and a half pound hammer and the it's not at all a thing about you know this is how big the hammer is I can swing a four and a half pound hammer it's about how you want to swing a hammer and how your style of working your build your body all of those things how they make you feel comfortable swinging a hammer and so with a job like this where there's a lot of drawing out I kind of opted to go for the four and a half pounder it's also quite a lovely hammer. This is one of the ones that Ethan made for us, one of our square circles, and it's a lovely, lovely piece of, lovely piece of work. And it's nice to work with nice tools. So, are we gonna be doing the Alex Steel drinking game? Great question asked by Eric Stevens. The Alex Steel drinking game always exists. And if you're unfamiliar, it goes like this. Every time I drop something, you drink. And of course, if you're a long-time viewer of the show, you'll remember my drink of choice for this is an orange juice. So grab yourself a good, good pint of orange juice and get ready because I'm going to be dropping some things and that's the perfect time for you to start drinking some things. So, if you haven't watched the latest video on the channel, you might be wondering what anvil this is. Well, this is a 140 pound cast steel anvil designed by us here that we are currently testing. So that is extremely exciting. It is hopefully gonna be available soon. We're gonna be testing it. We wanna be putting it through its paces, seeing how it works, seeing if we're happy with it. So far, in the little that I have used it, I'm just thrilled. I'm ecstatic that I get to use an anvil that has my touch mark on it. I mean, that's a hell of a blessing. That's something I could have only ever dreamed of. But uh, fortunately, here we are. So this is very exciting. Brand new video showed us getting this thing you know, in ship shape and ready to go. So if you haven't watched that video, 
and uh, you get bored of my ramblings on this stream, do feel free to go and check it out. It's live on the channel now. In case you're curious as to what I'm doing, I'm just cooling off the back end there in a pit of water. I'm trying to save it from heating up too much. One downside to the fact that we're working in a propane forge, unlike a you know coke or coal forge, is I have to heat up the whole thing, which is kind of annoying, because we're going to be getting a lot of oxidation here. What I'm going to do, if I go ahead and do this, is the opening of the forge is narrower than the length, or shorter in distance than the length. So I'm just going to heat the thing up in the opening, this way. That'll hopefully help. We'll center ourselves back out. And we'll go ahead and read some more comments from you lovely folks. Holy mackerel. 7,000 people. That's kind of, that's a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So pleased that we got so many of you here. I'm so grateful. So grateful. Ah, glad to hear you guys are excited to see that the live show is here. Yes. Alec and the evolution of the forge door. Comment by Ryan Ryder. I think that's pretty it. We, just, we can just make another series, you know, which is evolving forge doors bit by bit through time backwards from ultra technological solutions of the 2020, well it was 2019 when I made them, all the way back to what this should have been, which is a cable and a foot pedal. We will get there soon. We will get there soon. Where have we hidden the doggo? The dog is at home. I figured it might be a little bit too much to live stream and take care of a dog at the same time. So there we go. When are we gonna get a Triton? That's a great project idea. Very good. Tommy Wilson, little brother of Nikki Wilson. They have asked for a shout out. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you so much, Kevin Moore. I really appreciate it. You guys rock. Very grateful to have you all here. So, here we go. Let's make a plan. I'm out of practice, and it shows. Because I don't know what I'm doing. So, if I recall correctly from when I was far more practiced, I'm gonna be using the far edge here for my most aggressive metal moving and I'm gonna be using the near edge of the anvil for when I wanna take it a little easier and bring it into size, and especially for when I wanna be making bars and reverse tapers. Now, a bar is kind of the expression for making a piece of steel with parallel sides, and then the tapers are about whether it tapers away from me as a forwards taper or towards me as a reverse taper. Okie dokie. See that, I caught it kind of almost there, we're two-thirds of the way to half of a pair of tongs. That doesn't mean that we're halfway there to the pair of tongs. No, I'm going to be keeping you for much longer. It's been a long while since I made a pair of tongs. It's probably going to take a little while. Because what we have to do is we have to draw out the reins enough that we have one half of a pair of tongs, draw out the reins enough for another half a pair of tongs, cut them in half, punch some holes, rivet them together, and it all starts to get really complicated towards the end. And so, you know, what I thought might be a nice, relaxing evening, probably gonna be a little bit more involved. It's okay, it's good fun. It's incredible to have you all here. Okie dokie. Oh, got a question. What is gonna be the price of the anvil? Yet to be fully determined. Uh, you know, pricing things, a little bit complex. Things that I still wanna take into account. I wanna see how it performs, you know, all those things are going to affect what it looks like. But if I was to give you a ballpark of what the anvil would cost, I would say it's going to be between $1,100 to $1,300. That's probably the region in which it's going to be. And so, you know, hopefully that you can kind of keep that in your head and, and mull over on that one and see if it's going to be a right decision for you. Jolly good. Here we go, back to work. So I want a little more length on this half of the pair of tongs. So I'm gonna take another inch over the far edge of the anvil, and we're gonna keep aggressively drawing that down. While I'm working, you might note 
that this anvil hasn't moved, which is a shock, because usually I'm chasing my anvil all over the place like a lunatic, because I've been too lazy to bolt it down, because I'm so unsure and unconfident about picking a place for its final resting place in here, because we're constantly moving stuff around. Well, if you follow my Instagram stories, you will see there is a Band-Aid holding the foot down. So if you haven't seen that story, please feel free to go and have a look. And then now I'm going to spoil all of that by letting you know it actually isn't a Band-Aid holding the anvil on the ground. I'm going to show you, actually. I can just go ahead and do this. See this? I'm sorry, folks. It isn't actually that Band-Aid. It's almost worse. I mean, is that even possible? Could it be worse than a Band-Aid? Well, let me get the camera centered again, and, and I think I'll... It's kind of embarrassing, to be frank. I use this. It's a hot glue gun. I hot glued the anvil to the concrete. How I have fallen. How I have fallen. What's shocking is it actually hasn't moved yet. So we'll see how hot gluing an anvil to the concrete does. But for now, it's working great. This anvil is solid as can be. So I'll keep you updated. Would I recommend hot gluing down an anvil? Absolutely not. But hey-ho, there we go. Uh, let's get a little more length on it. Two, I'm going to use the, try and take some, take some of my own medicine, some of my own advice here. And I'm going to use the far edge of the anvil at the top of the heat to break down material while it's hottest. And then as our piece of steel gets cool, I'll then come back down to here. Use the cold material, the flat side of the hammer, the near edge of the anvil together to do some of our more gentle work. Some of the work that requires a little less force, a little more precision, such as knocking off corners, bringing them to octagon, and then right at the bottom of the heat, even doing a little bit of a rough rounding. I'm kind of three quarters on the anvil, three quarters off. Uh, nope, that doesn't make sense. Three quarters on, quarter off, which means that I'm kind of hitting like this. So there's about a quarter of the anvil, hammer off the anvil, three quarters of the hammer on the anvil, and that kind of means that we get a little less pressure at the point of impact, but we still get a little bit of a concentration right at this near edge. Back in the forge we go. Wow, blacksmithing is tiring. This is a workout. Okie dokie. Will I make a Damascus Bala song? Asks K Moore. I think that is an awesome idea. Isn't it toasty in here? It's boiling hot. Damascus Ballet song, I really like that idea. What I want to prioritize above the Damascus Ballet song, firstly, is opening this door because it's like 400 degrees, probably right above the forge, which means that near the forge, it's like 80 degrees, so I can't deal with that. I want to prioritize making an automatic knife, an auto knife, a ching, you know, like a give me your money, ching, that, that type of knife, you know, with the whoosh. One of those blades, that's what I want to make first. Damascus Battle Song, I love the idea. And I know it's a pretty popular, popular blade. Oh, now this is the coolest idea ever. And I never use hyperbole, which means that you know it's true because I never say things in such an exclamatory manner. Somebody recommended to properly test the anvil, we should send it to Demolition Ranch for him to shoot it and explode it. And I think that is the best idea I've heard over the last period of time. I don't know how long, but that's an amazing idea. Sending this animal to Demolition Ranch for him to test, that is brilliant. I want to make that happen. When we get our first batch of these things cast, we're going to send one to him so he can shoot it. It makes no sense. From a marketing perspective, it achieves nothing just seeing one of our beautiful anvils 
get blown to pieces by you know, incendiary 50 BMG rounds. Makes no sense. But sometimes the stupidest things make no sense. And so they just make no sense. It is toasty. It is toasty. I hope everybody's noticed that we haven't talked about something. We haven't talked about it. So, what is that thing? It kind of defeats the. I just talked about it. Okay, I can try better to not talk about it. We're here to lighten people's moods. So, we're not talking about dark, sad things. Lighten moods. Lighten moods. Here we go. On to the next one. Thank you, Pirate Captain Gunby, Gunby, Pirate Captain, for the idea for sending an anvil to Demolition Ranch. On to the next one. Da 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 da. Aha! Smile for me has asked. Alec, thank you, by the way, for the 10 pounds. I really appreciate it. Alec, about the new old power hammer, I'm curious if the seals on the ram, which act like a piston, could be bad. In cars, cracked piston rings could blow. Could be why the ram hits the top. So, in case you're not familiar, because I also have been unfamiliar with these things before, the ram itself, it isn't just a piece of cast and machine steel running up in there. Well, it is, but there are these piston rings, which are these rings of cast iron, which are the wearing part, which you can replace. They stick up about 10 thousandths of an inch, or about a quarter of a millimeter, and maybe, no, they stick up more than that, for goodness sake. They stick up off the edge of the ram, and that's what rides on it. And if they didn't seal well, that could be how it's leaking. Well, I took out the top piston ring. It didn't make it into the video, but when I was grinding the weld on the top of the ram, I thought it was fine. You know, I'd make a little dust, I'd clean it up. Well, invariably, I made a lot of dust, and I had to do a lot more cleaning up than I would have liked to do. I actually had to pull the ram all the way up to the point that I got the piston ring out so that I could clean all of that and make sure both the ram and the cylinder were entirely clean. And so I have taken that piston ring out, and I will say, it felt like it was an awfully good fit, so I'm not particularly worried about the piston ring fit up. I also heard uh, from the person that I bought it from, I feel like they were relatively new. I did think I was getting a spare set. Or maybe it was that these were new and that's what, that's how it was going. Anyway, I feel like the piston rings are, are good, but then again, I can be wrong and I think that's absolutely an avenue to pursue if we still can't fix it. So thank you very much for that. What tools do you suggest making or buying first when getting into blacksmithing? Well, the first thing you're gonna need is a forge and an anvil. With a forge and an anvil, you're gonna get cracking from there. You can start to make your own tongs, your own punch, well, your own punches and then your own tongs, all of that stuff to, to kind of get cracking. Do you wanna turn a fan on? Or should we open, I'll just open this more. So I would start first, like, you know, get cracking, try and make some leaves, make some tapers, things like that. And then you can go ahead and make yourself a round punch from either a piece of coil spring, go to your local steel supplier, get a piece of 4140 medium carbon steel or equivalent EN19, EN24 in the UK. And, uh, you know, only needs to be about five eighths of an inch round or so. And you can make a round punch. You can make slot punches, square punches, all of these things. You can get a rough feel for heat treating and all of that. And you can have a very good time to learn a lot making punches. Once you've made punches, what I'm doing right now is a really great project to work on, which is making a pair of tongs. You know, it's an involved project. Making a pair of tongs can, depending on how far you want to go, how neat you want them to look, it can be extremely difficult and extremely complicated. So work up to it. Learn how to do forward and reverse tapers. Make leaves, get comfortable making leaves. Because you can make a whole bunch of leaves really nicely with only an anvil, a forge, and pliers. You don't need necessarily a really good pair of tongs to make leaves, because you just buy bar stock, you cut it into handling lengths, and when it's too short to use, you just throw it in a pile, because you know, you're gonna be putting a dollar in the scrap pile, which you can then use on a project down the line once you've acquired the skills. 
to learn how to make a pair of tongs, and you can use the tongs to hold the scrap steel. I'm rambling, but you know, work on making leaves and things like that, and then build up to a punches and tongs. You get the idea. OK. It's a little thicker here than it is there. It might not be thicker. It might just not be tapering in the right way. So I'm going to try and remember that. I have at least the length for one half of my pair of tongs. And we're going to use some of this material here, stretch it on out, get ourselves a little further. So we'll just go ahead and do that. Is it a little overexposed? OK. Let's have a look. Yeah, it is. Hmm. If I had more lights, I could pump a little more light onto myself. So the thing that we're thinking about is the background's pretty, pretty bright. So I'm wondering if that affects the video. You guys can let us know what you think. Does it kind of make all this stuff look a little fuzzy or unclear having that? Not so good. OK. We'll just close the door a little bit. We'll suffer. We'll sweat. And it'll feel like I'm actually working. OK. I'm very pleased. Click 9210. Very pleased. Thank you for the little, little, little bit of money. I appreciate that. And he says this is his first live stream, but he watched all the ones before. So I'm very happy you get to join us on this inaugural re-live stream. Here we go. Let's forge some steel. Da 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 da. It's getting a little hot to hold. Oh, my hands are not tough enough. So we're going to cool it off in a bit of water. Let that have a cool. Okie dokie. Hello, Ashley Catlow from Helena, Montana. What happened to the Zweihender? The what? I don't know what you're talking about. The Zweihender? I'd love to make a Zweihender someday. I reckon we can probably finish it in a week if we start one. Seriously, the Zweihander is not abandoned. It is still here. It's still in the process of being finished. We have a little bit more work to do to it. And kind of the idea that I'd had as I diverted attention from it was, we'll go ahead and hold off on finishing it until we get Will to come back. We're three quarters of the way through the last episode. We're almost there. All we need to do is essentially stitch a little bit of leather, glue it up, sharpen it, and it's done. And I was kind of waiting, you know, I thought, you know, okay, we had this lockdown coming on with the, uh, the uh, thing that we're not mentioning on this positive live stream. And I thought, you know, what, I'll just wait a couple weeks till Will's back, we'll finish it together, have his help on the sharpening, because he's going to do a way better job than I am, you know, be able to, you know, finish it as a team instead of me just kind of finishing it on my own. I thought that was appropriate. Well, now the two weeks turned into a month, so it's taking a little bit longer. We'll get there eventually, though. The Zweihender is not forgotten. It's delayed. Flat side of my hammer, if you're curious, working on the near side of the anvil. Cleaning it up at a low temperature where we can be a little bit more accurate, do a little less work. Also see a little bit clearer. OK. 
Great to have you all here. Great to have you all here. So thank you, Stony Panda, for asking about this Vihander. It's not familiar. It's not. It's not abandoned, and we will finish it after the quarantine. Michael Groves asks, when do we get to see the missus? Well, kind of depends. It depends on when she feels comfortable. It depends on we, when we feel comfortable with it. You know, lots of people are always asking, when are we going to see the wife? Alex, show us your wife. I, with the business side of things, I have a very public life. With the business side of things, you get to, you know, see a whole lot, and it's all out there to see. But interestingly, my wife and I are actually kind of quite private people. And so, you know, being able to stay a little bit private suits us well. And so that's why we don't put all of our private life out on the internet for everybody to see because we don't feel comfortable with it right now. Might we feel more comfortable with it in the future? Potentially. For now, however, we don't quite feel so comfortable. So we kind of live our private life privately, like every single other person in the world does. It's just that as a person with a little bit of a public profile, the two can often end up kind of intermingling a little bit, and so a little bit of, a little bit of private life is good. Who cut my hair? My lovely wife. She cut my hair. She always cuts my hair. So I'm very happy. I got the... Sorry? Just, just this time it's a little bit shorter. And in case you're wondering, Alec, you have one of your employees here in the workshop. How could you be so irresponsible? I don't. It is, uh, it is my lovely wife who is behind there, who I'm talking to. And so, any, any germs that we could be exchanging here, we exchanged before the, before the show with a little peck on the cheek. This is PG. We're going to be very appropriate. Hello from Denver, says C. Simpson, sending us $10. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. I appreciate that. He is asking, are there any updates on the forge? The mega forge. Uh, well, I got some great, it's, you've got to wait for the video to be fully up to speed, but I'm going to spoil it all now. I got some great advice from a blacksmith named Matthew Harris, who recommended using a bouncy castle blower instead of the blowers that we have, because a bouncy castle blower pushes some good volume as well as good pressure. I used to use Bouncy Castle blowers on coal and coke forges back when I used to use coal and coke forges. He recommended I try a uh, Bouncy Castle blower. I'm going to try one. I ordered one on Amazon, 120 bucks. We're going to give it a go, see if it works. I just haven't got to it yet. So thank you very much, Mr. Simpson, for the kind gift and the question. Thank you, Vincent, for the $5. I'm pleased that you like the content. Having tried before, would you try to make a one-day sword again? Asks Jeffrey. Firstly, again, thank you, Jeffrey. I appreciate you sending a few bucks our way. It means a whole lot. Making a one-day sword, I think I spent 14 hours on the thing. I don't know if I have that same useful energy. Do you see this? See this, folks? This is a beard. It's a beard, everybody. I've been growing a beard. It shows my old age. My beard is currently at the level of a, well, admittedly, a 16-year-old that's a little bit too reckless to heed his mother's advice that his beard looks terrible. But it's a corona beard, which means I don't have to look good. I can look scruffy and look like I'm 16, and I don't feel comfortable buying razor blades. Because it's fine, right? It's fine. My beard looks great. Anyway, wow, I've deviated from the point. The point is this, I'm old. My joints, they creak. The whopping age of 22 has crept up on me. And I don't know if I can quite do a one day sword like I did when I was a young 20 year old whippersnapper. I don't know, it's, that'd be taxing. It would be a fun project though. It would be fun, a good chance. Okay, dog, I'm just reeling up some more questions here. Incredible, everybody, thank you so much. 8.9 thousand viewers, thank you. See if we can crack nine or 10. It'd be incredible. Thank you, Fanny Golf. I'm very pleased that you are excited by blacksmithing and you wanna, you wanna keep increasing your skills. Here we go. A little more drawing. 
out of hot steel. It's getting floppy because it's really warm. So this is where it gets difficult. Now it's, there's so much sticking out and it's so thin and hot there that it's just kind of flopping about. I'm struggling to work. I'm probably about at the point of cutting it off and flipping it around. Before I do that, I'm going to grab, oh, 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 that sucks. That was so painful. Did you see that? I just walked right into that treadle. I'm fine. It's all good. If you, I don't know how, if your line of sight works for that, folks. This treadle is at the perfect height for hitting your shin or your feet if you're walking a little, the hammer's in the way. The Chambersburg treadle is just at the perfect height for hitting if you're walking a little too carelessly. So I just walked into it. Okie dokie. Yeah, I think we're about the cutting off point. It's a, little, it's a little bent and funky. And I'd like to clean it up before I cut it off. Because right now we have all of this material to hold on to. And so it just makes for a nice and easy time. So what I'm going to do is something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to try and use one of my 14 brain cells and come up with a plan that makes the most sense, is the most efficient, and is the best use of heat. OK, here we go. I am going to something, something. I'm going to start at the end here, and I will clean it up, chisel a groove in this jaw, straighten it, punch a hole, and then from the end back, because that's from the thickest end of the taper, because these are tapered the whole way down, from the end back and all the way back down here, I will then clean it up with some gentle hammer blows, taking care to make it all look neat and pretty before we cut it off and do the same on the other side. So I need to prepare a chisel and a punch. And I will also answer your questions so I get distracted. Nick Bustle, thank you very much for the money. I appreciate it. Have I ever made any kind of mini dagger? We made a stiletto, which is quite similar to a mini dagger. We dealt with Niels Vandenberg, Josh Smith, and of course, Will Stelter. Will recently made a dagger with Kurt Harland. So I don't know if that quite counts. Okie dokie, okie dokie. So, I have a punch. Da 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 da. Here's a punch. Put that somewhere handy. And put it right there and hopefully not lose it. Now I'm going to go and get a chisel. So you'll have to use your imagination a little bit. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> Chisel. Here we go. Let's do it. Little, little bit of wire brushing at a hot heat. Sorry about that. I get you. And um, you know, actually, before I start hammering on it, I'm going to straighten it. It's a little twisted, so. Oh wow, this is a hot piece of steel. It is burning me. So I'm going to take a pair of tongs. Can you see this vice? I hope you can. My jaw is just a little off kilter. A little wonky. So fix that. We'll take another heat. I don't think it's the most efficient use of heat to have just, you know, taken this nice big hot heat. Oh, I burnt myself. Nice big hot heat and, and then only have twisted it. It's going to have to work. This is exceedingly hot. I've been just flipping it around in the bucket of water. I'm just cooling off one end. I'm going to grab a little cup so that I can properly douse it in water and really, really cool it. Because that's it's no fun to just get burnt. Lots of people ask, Alec, do you get burnt all the time? You must, you must get burnt all the time. Well, fortunately, because 
you know, either because you get weak or you get smart. You kind of start to learn how to not burn yourself, which is great. And you don't burn yourself as much. Okie doke. So you can see what I'm doing. I have a bucket of water and I pour it. Fascinating stuff, I know. You can have that tip for free. Oakley dokely. Here we go, back in the fire. The forge is cranking. That is one hot forge. Ah! Ah. I'm gonna try not to die from dehydration. We'll open up some more of your comments. Okie dokie. How long does your forge take to heat to proper temperature? What temperature do we use for Damascus jobs? Can a single burner forge work for Damascus jobs? Says Andy Sellers. Thank you, Andy. The incredible $20, I sincerely appreciate it. As well as the great question. This forge takes approximately 20 minutes to heat up to forging temperature. Maybe a little more like 30 minutes to get to forge welding temperature. Now, what temperature is that? I don't exactly know, you know, and I think I, I might be wrong if I was to try and tell you the exact temperature. It might be 23, 24, 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? I don't know. I can tell you a little bit better by the color that I see. I want to forge weld at a high yellow temperature to a white temperature. If it's orange, you're typically going to struggle to get quite the same forge weld that you would otherwise. And so high, high yellow works for me. And obviously, that's different if your forge is outside in the sun or if you're in a dark workshop. This is a pretty well-lit workshop. And if the forge looks like it's a high yellow, I'm generally pretty happy. What is a high yellow? Look at the temperature that I bring this out. A little hotter than that's where I like to forge weld. And yes, a single burner forge can absolutely achieve that. But that is like asking, can a two and a half liter engine take a vehicle 70 miles an hour? Yes. What vehicle can it take? Can it take a giant, huge 18 wheeler up to 70 miles an hour? Probably not. Can it take a little Golf TDI Volkswagen to 70 miles an hour? Hell yeah, and way beyond. Uh, and so if you have a very well-built forge and you have a relatively small chamber, absolutely. I mean, it, you know what? It depends. It depends. But single burner forges are used by plenty of people to make Damascus. Look at the latest video that Will made for the channel where he made Damascus by hand. He was using a single burner propane forge. So there's definitely an option, and there's definitely a possibility for it. The forge just has to be designed, right? All of that. Mm, people are asking about the trousers, these things. Interesting. Here, folks are curious about the cloth on my legs. I think you are right to be curious, because I think they are rather fantastic. Now, as the beginning of the stream, I will have let you all know, I consider those of you to be tuning in to my ramblings here, unedited. My ramblings that don't have the luxury of Jamie being able to pick through them and cut out all the stupid, boring stuff and my bad jokes. These ramblings, those of you that sit through this, I'm gonna give you sneak peeks. Shh. Shh. These trousers. are the trousers. This is a prototype pair of a little uh, secret something something, you know, that is very comfortable and might be able to be worn by some more people, if you know what I'm saying. If you get what I'm putting down, if you 
underpant what I'm saying. They're very comfortable. Good pair of work pants. Stay tuned, guys. I'm working on it. There's so much behind the scenes stuff going on. Very difficult to work out when's the right time to announce it. But you know, you guys, you're in the you're in the inner circle, so we can keep a few secrets between ourselves. Terry Finch from South Carolina. Thank you very much for the 10 bucks. Appreciate it. He's asked a great question. Why do I hold the hammer so high up close to the head? Age old question. Um, rightly so. I remember growing up always hearing you should hold a hammer. Always hearing, like all of you did, you should hold a hammer down the shaft. But then as I started blacksmithing, it kind of started to feel a little bit uncomfortable to hold the hammer way down the back end of the shaft, and I didn't have quite as much control as when I held it closer to the head. I also started blacksmithing when I was particularly young, and so I was quite weak. I didn't have the strength to be able to handle a hammer at the end of the shaft. And what I gravitated towards was using a slightly heavier hammer held closer to the end or held closer to the head. I gravitated towards that because that's what suited me. Suits the way I wanted to work. It was part of you know, the great inspiration and education that I got from Brian Brazil on how he works, is using a heavier hammer, hammering at a slower cadence, etc., etc. Sorry, I've got to adjust the forge here. I'm going to try and not ramble too much. But it's what suited me, was using a heavier hammer and holding it closer to the head so that I didn't have to use a lighter hammer held further away. Helped me feel more comfortable at the anvil. Helps me get my body in closer to the work. Helps me see my work. It just suits me. I'd rather swing this a little slower than take a lighter hammer and have to whip it faster. I feel a little more in control. So that's essentially it. Why does all of this handle exist if you rarely use it? Reasons, I'm sure. It feels good. It helps it give it a natural feel when there's all this wood sticking out here. And it suits me. And when I do have a slightly lighter hammer, like this three and a half pounder, you know, I could, I'll be using it up near the head like I usually do, but sometimes I might hold it down here and give it a really good, get really good wang, you know, good whip to it. And so sometimes you want the extra handle length. It's also like a marketing thing because I don't want to be, uh, you know, selling everybody a hammer with a nine inch long handle. Because there's a whole lot of you that would feel good to take a three and a half pound hammer and swing it way back here using all 15 inches of the handle. And so we don't want to sell you a hammer that you don't have enough handle on if that's, uh, if that's how you like to work. So there's a whole lot sticking out because that's just kind of how we make them. So we're going to get ready to punch a hole. Starting on this side here with that shoulder dropped over the anvil. That was very funny. I guess I'm used to an anvil where the, pr the, the punch sits in the pritchel hole. That's okay. I'm not going to complain about the anvil right after I get it. I mean, I've designed it with a 5 8 hole, and that is it's a smaller punch. Thank you for the great question, Terry. Personal preference is essentially why I hold the handle there. Simply put, says Matt Lewandowski, Lewandowski, you use a choked grip because it works for you, but others, a more open grip is preferred. Absolutely. Jeffrey, for five dollars, thank you, by the way, says you hold a stonemason's hammer for the same reason, and it helps with the balance of it. Oh, okie dokie. I'm going to take the punch out after every blow. I got down to the bottom. See that little bullseye on the back there? Out of battery? Okay. I'm not going to hammer on it. 
so we can flatten off the surface a little bit, get a little more reverse taper coming in. I will say my work has oxidized a lot. You know, with all my rambling, I've let it sit in the fire a little longer than it should. And when I turned down the forge a little earlier, I turned it down the lazy way by simply just reducing the amount of fuel going in, which gave me an extra oxidizing flame. So, kind of kicking myself for that choice there. I'm gonna come in again from our first side, then I'm going to flip it, find my mark. But having done it again, that last blow, it really helps shine up where the mark is anyway. We're now gonna punch plug. There we go, we punched a hole. Okie doke. So, I'm gonna change batteries on this camera here. Thank you very much. I tell you what, we have not done a live stream in a long time. And getting all of the software and hardware set up again to do this, real blast from the past. Remembering days at the Barker Street workshop with Sam at 10 o'clock at night when we would start those things. I think it was 10 o'clock at night. Insane. Insanity. God, how things have changed. I remember the first live stream that we did, there were 50 people watching at the most. And I was, I was reflecting on this with my wife a little bit earlier. I remember going home and thinking, oh my goodness. This is life-changing, unbelievable. And to think that from then, so much has changed. There's now so many of you watching. I mean, that's just incredible. It's, it's a, real, a real blessing. I don't want to make that sound like a, a, a horn-tooting kind of thing to say, like, look at me, this is, this is where, you know, where I got. I mean, it's, frankly, it, I, it feels unbelievable. But I hope to, you know, people who were in my position, it can be reassuring to think of what is possible in a very short amount of time. I mean, it certainly freaks me out to think that that was possible. We went from 50 people watching a live show, and then now we've got 9,000 people watching. Unbelievable, unbelievable. So I'm very grateful for that. And you know, having all you folks be so, so loyal and friendly and, and willing to share in this journey that we share in it's pretty unbelievable, and so I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Okay, back to being tough. Thank you, all of you, for the kind comments. I really appreciate it. Oh, drink, 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 drink. Oh, you know what? I'm way behind in the comments. Of course, the Alex Steele drinking game. I dropped my punch. Okie dokie. That's a hot piece of steel. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. I'm just cleaning it up a little bit, having a good time. Okie dokie. Oh, I was gonna chisel a thing in that. I haven't made a pair of tongs in so long. I've just frankly forgotten everything. Oh, almost. I'm gonna put a brick on the ground to stand on because whenever you chisel these tong jaws, you've got to stand up a little higher than normal. Ah, and interestingly, it's the jaw has twisted again. I might fall off. The Alex Steel drinking game applies if I fall too, so get ready. I'm standing on one fire brick. Ah! Oh. Okay, two feet, still on the ground, doesn't count. Ah, I'm happy with that. We do need to drift the hole though. So, what I have here, is a piece of quarter inch steel bar. We're gonna make a drift, and we're gonna make the heat in one drift. I'm gonna make the drift in one heat, rather. That is the challenge I will set for myself. What you will see here, 
is a hot cut. Slight variation of a Brian Brazil style hot cut. You might see me make one on this stream, but I don't want to fully commit myself to that because I think I already have my work cut out making these tongs in less than five hours. Uh, this has a tapered shank on it. The reason that's tapered is just like the key holding a power hammer in place, or a power hammer die in place, this gets forced into the hardy hole and it locks itself in place. Because you're working with such a limited surface area on the blade, you're able to do this, hopefully, without splitting an anvil heel. Watch me bite my tongue when this brand new anvil that we are testing splits right now. So, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. But this is, if you use a uh, bottom fuller, which has a much wider profile, if you use that in an anvil heel, I think you'd probably end up splitting it no matter what anvil you had. And so you would only do this tapered shank tool with a blade, with a hot cut. It has a rounded edge, nice and thin, and the nice thing is it doesn't rattle around. Anyway, we're making a drift. That is only important when we're cutting it. And I stupidly committed myself to making this thing in one heat, so I best hurry up. because now I'm not in the condition of practice to, to be making such promises. That was irresponsible. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So, you know, people were asking about hammers and where you hold them. You know, the downside to using a slightly heavier hammer is if I was trying to do work like I'm doing now, I can only work at a much slower cadence. Right then, if I was using a lighter hammer, I would be hammering much faster. And at those low temperatures, where this small piece of steel is cooling down so rapidly. And all I'm trying to do is just clean it up. Being able to hammer quickly is fantastic. Being able to go tack, 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 tack. I couldn't do it. I was hitting as fast as I could with that hammer. So there's a lot of pros and cons to everything, as with everything in life. There are benefits. There are downsides. You pick and choose for the work at hand and what makes you feel good. And would you look at that? Da -da 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 -da. We made a drift. If you'll uh, catch my drift. Uh, it's good, right? It's good. So, that can go right. Drink! Orange juice, that is. Hercule dokely. Let's drift a hole. Let's drift a hole. Let's drift a hole. Found the right hole here on our little drifting plate. Make sure this is nice and hot. Uh oh. You can see it in the wide one there, right? So, well, we have the drift in there. I can do a little few bits and bobs. I can straighten out that wonky jaw that we've been struggling with. On this twisted. There we go. Ah, look at that. Ah, oh, it's hot. Get a few bits and bobs in order. Clean some things up. A little spring cleaning on the tongs. Look at that. This is not going to be my best pair of tongs, but I feel like we'll be able to, I think we'll be pretty happy once these things are done. It'll have been a good time. Touch mark. Get rid of the drift. I 
I know I'm biased because I designed this anvil, but I am loving it. This is lovely. This is very, very lovely. Oh, yes. So, it is now time for us to cut this bad mama jammer off, flip it around, and make the other half of the pair of tongs. <sighs> but you know what? I feel a little peckish. I feel a little peckish. Do you happen to have? Oh my I goodness. I am spoiled. I am spoiled. Thank you so much. Okie doke. All this hammering has me starving, but I'm fortunate that. No problem. That we have a solution. Let's answer some more questions. Cody Renfro, I am. Hugely grateful, and that is incredibly unnecessary. But thank you, Cody. I appreciate it, and thank you for your service. Rostophilus says he's really feeling the nostalgia with your stream, man. I think I've been watching four years now. Estimated time of arrival on anvil availability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it depends. I want to make sure I give the anvil a really good, good run through. You know, I want to make sure there aren't any things that creep up on us, because. There's a whole lot of factors that are important when you're trying to sell a product. Obviously, as you would all know, you're all consumers, which means it's, it's uh, no, I mean, I, that doesn't sound good. I'm trying to phrase it in the way that by having bought something, you can empathize with what is important for being able to sell something, which is I want to be able to offer, I want to be able to offer a really good product at a reasonable price that allows us the margins to make it worth doing and make us be able to offer the level of customer service that we feel is important for us to offer as a business. Because when we try and sell our things, you know, it's all, all great and what have you, but we don't want to be just selling our things and that's that and, you know, goodbye forever, there's no more. You need to be able to have the margins when you sell something. Thank you so, so, so much. <gasps> Round of applause for Mrs. Steele. Got an incredible few pancakes with Nutella here to enjoy and tuck in, so thank you. She's helping, well, she entirely fuels this. And so please give her your thanks if you're grateful for this show existing. So it's important that we make a good product and we have the margins to be able to provide the requisite customer service to support that product. And all part of that is making sure that the product lasts. Because you can't have a, have a product that you can't support because it breaks, it chips, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't provide people value. And so I'm really trying to think you know, long term as much as I can, and I don't want to rush into it and sell a whole load of people anvils that then end up breaking because that would be no fun. I want to make sure that I feel confident that you're going to get a good anvil. So we're going to be testing it. And of course, the plan is we're going to launch pre-orders first so we can get people in for the very first batch and we can make sure that we have as many anvils made as there are ordered so that if it's a product that people want, we can supply it to them. And then of course, you know, there's a whole lot of factors in it. I'm probably going into more detail than that's necessary, but you know, I want to make sure that we can plan out well what is our warranty strategy going to be for these, you know, how much of what can you warranty on an anvil? I mean, it's a tool that people literally beat the daylights out of. You know, that's kind of uncharted territory for, for, you know, what do you do if somebody has a problem with something after they hit it with a sledge? If you hit an Apple computer with a sledge, they might not be so thrilled. But if you were forging with a sledgehammer on this here anvil and a bad thing happened, you'd probably expect me to do something about it, which is entirely reasonable. So all of this needs to be thought of. And that's what I want to, well, I want to take our time. I want to make sure this is a good product. We've got a good offering, good warranty plan in place. Make sure that people feel good buying from us and, and make sure that we can follow through with the overall values and mission of the business. 
Oh my goodness. Goth Downing, thank you. If you email us, I'd be thrilled to give you a gift. So thank you, Goth. If you can email us with like a screenshot of your YouTube page, I want to send you some stuff because that is just unbelievable of you. He sent $400. So I want to get you set up with a box of some swag. So send us an email, support at Forge Steel. Send a screenshot of your, your home page or like a payment confirmation. That would be, e yeah, payment confirmation that shows this. You probably will have had one in your email inbox. So then we can make sure that it's you and it's not the 9,000 699 people that might also want a box of swag, but didn't actually make that donation. Garth, if you email support at Forged Steel, I'd be incredibly grateful. If, if you're not Garth right now, and you're thinking about sending that email, and you, well, please email support at Forged Steel if you ever have any problems from a product that you purchase with us. Customer service inquiries, support at Forged Steel is the email. Goodness, so many caveats. But if you're trying to email claiming to be Garth, and you're not, Stop right now. This is Garth's email to write, not yours. Thank you, Garth. I want to send you some gifts. I'm really grateful. I'm really, really grateful. His question was, when will you do another stainless steel Damascus project? And my answer is, maybe sooner than you think. Because the Barefoot Forge, Chris Cowan, I think is that pronounced his last name? I was recently on a podcast with him. Recently on the Maker's Happy Hour podcast. Check that out. But in that podcast, he said, Alec, old bean, old pal, I would like to send you some stainless steel Damascus for you to play with. And he gave me the obligation that I would only use the stainless steel to make the most stupid thing I could imagine. So I have to make something stupid with the stainless steel Damascus. And so stainless steel Damascus might be happening sooner than you think because we might just have ourselves a care package of stainless steel Damascus on the way from Pennsylvania courtesy of the Barefoot Forge. Check him out on Instagram. Thank you, Garth, for the question. I would love to hear everybody's ideas on what would be the most stupid thing for us to make out of stainless steel Damascus. <gasps> I made a mishit. Oh, ah, that's a bad one. So, I made a mishit and I put a big old dent in there that didn't look good. Not good. You'll notice I didn't make as much progress on the last one. Well, what I'd like to do is give you some excuses as to why that's the case, which sound incredibly plausible. Well, there is a kind of excuse that I think is reasonable, and that is this. When we're working on making the one heat tongue blank from the other side, let me adjust the forge down a little bit, this time I'm closing the air, we have all the radio, the, 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 the thing we do. Oh my goodness. Come on, Alec. There's 10,000 people watching here. Get your stuff together. All of the residual heat that's in the bar conducts through and keeps it hot for longer. Um, but now, we don't have as much residual heat because it tapers off right back there. So that's what's happening. So what were you saying, darling? Another big one? Holy mackerel. Thank you, Merrick909. Goodness gracious, same treatment. Email us, Merrick909. Let's, 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 let's get you a little swag collection. I'm very grateful. Sorry? Oh, I've got to eat. Thank you. What good advice? Thank you, darling. I'm good, let's do some tapering. Here we go. Ta-da! Progress. Another one? Are you guys kidding? So, Merrick909, please email us, support at forgesteel.com. What about a Guan Dao? I know it's a giant weapon, but it could be really cool. 
I actually don't know what a Guandao is, so I'm very sorry that I can't help with that. Oh my goodness. Seth J? $500 for the donation war? Holy mackerel, thank you, Seth. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Thank you. Again, same applies, email us. Let's get you hooked up with some stuff. Email us a screenshot of your payment confirmation. Holy moly, thank you, folks. Whew. Wowza, well, incredible. Okie doke. Is your goal to make your online store the one-stop shop for everything a blacksmith will need to get started? I think it is. I mean, our kind of goals are like this, to inspire people, YouTube channel, educate people, we're working on that. We have the online school, which you can check out, but I want to work on refurbishing that and turning it into an even better offering. And then equipping people too, which is the online store. We want to be able to give you as much value as possible. And so that's why anvils, hammers, things like that, all things we're working on, get you inspired with the content that we make and then be able to offer you an easy place to find the tools that are gonna make you able to pursue the hobby. So yeah. Okay, I'm burning my steel. I'm rambling too much, folks. My former self would yell at me. Da 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 da. More pancake. Thank you. Ugly, ugly. Stuff is happening. Okay, I'm gonna go into the forge sideways again here. I don't have my forge dialed quite right. There's a little too much oxygen for the amount of fuel, which is why that piece was burned, because it was hot with a whole lot of oxygen. I'm gonna turn that down. Oh my goodness, more? Holy mackerel. $400.01? Caleb Fink! Thank you, Caleb. Wow! What do you miss most about your old workshop? God, that's a good question. You know, I get nostalgic from time to time. What do I miss most about that old workshop? Swafiga was good. Next day shipping, that was good. Being by the coast and being by family, I think that's kind of probably the most important thing. You can wait a couple days for an Amazon delivery. But I think the thing that I get most nostalgic about is like the area that it is. It's a really lovely, I mean, there's mountains outside the door. I'm not gonna complain that much, you know. This is incredible. But one gets nostalgic, of course. I think the area, being by the coast, being by family, I think they're the most important things that I miss about the old workshop. I miss being able to hang out with Jamie, the editor, and you know, he did film for us, now he edits, you know? Incredible, the incredible duo that we became from working together. The incredible work he does on our videos. It was great having him here in January, but you know, that's something to miss. Kevin Giles, $500. Holy mackerel. Thank you, Kevin. He said he didn't want swag, he just wants, he just wants to be friendly and that means a whole lot. If you do want swag, email us. And I email us a copy of your confirmation. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, goodness gracious, you guys rock. This is a special thing and I'm feeling so grateful that we decided to do this live stream because it's nice to get back on the horse and hang out with you guys. You know, it's uh, a lot of times it kind of feels like 
making just the regular YouTube comment content can become a little distant from you. The, the relationships that we have with you folks, the viewers who enjoy what it is that we do, I feel like sometimes there can be a little bit of a disparity there. As we do our regularly scheduled YouTube content, you know, I, we get so flustered. I get so flustered trying to make as much content as we can so we can operate the business the way that it needs to be operated that it's easy to get a little detached from you folks. So it makes me happy that we can hang out, you know, a little face to face in this secret little club with you folks. Like we said at the beginning, you're all in the, in the, in the secret club here. It's nice that we get to hang out and, and interact a little more personally like this, be able to read your comments and all of that. So I'm, I'm very grateful about that. It makes me feel good. I'm very grateful, very, very grateful. Holy cow. Brian Beppel, thank you so much, Brian. For goodness sake, you did not need to do that. Thank you. Will we be doing more live streams in the future? Brian, email us too. Let's get you hooked up with some stuff. I really appreciate that. Will we be doing more live streams in the future? Well, you might be able to tell my voice is already going. So my voice isn't cut out for doing a whole lot of this, but I feel like we definitely need to do some more of this. If you folks are enjoying this and you want to see more, I think I wanted to do some more too. This is good fun. It's difficult because, you know, a lot of the projects that we do are not the type of projects where we get to, uh, we get to just, you know, get it done like that nice and fast. Can't make us Vihander on a live stream, bore everybody to death. It's always a balance because we've got to try and, you know, make the most of the limited time that we have. But I'm pleased that you guys are enjoying this if you are. We'll be doing some more of these. This is good fun. And I'm having a great time hanging out with you all. Okay, so I'm working on these reins and we're making progress. And I'm just gonna ramble on some more and burn some more metal and make a little bit of progress too. Spend some time eating, eating crepes. Can I just say, if you've never, oh, pardon me, I hope you didn't hear that burp. Phew. I kind of let, let, you know, as, as you're talking, you let one out, you go, whoa, you know, a little bit of an impromptu burp. If you've never had a crepe, you know, a, a proper French-style pancake with Nutella, you're missing out. Heaven. Heaven. Try it. You will not regret it. It's better than a crepe with just chocolate. So if you like, you know, you like your pancakes with some chocolate, throw some Nutella on there, it's going to be a good time. Mmm. This is where the heavy hammer is a little bit of a nuisance. I can't hit fast enough for the work that I need to do. When you're rounding things, you know, you're trying to make very small marks around the periphery of a piece of steel, for goodness sake. And you need to get as many hammer blows in there as possible. And so not being able to have a high enough cadence with the hammer can get a little frustrating. Because when you're doing normal work with a larger, larger hammer and you're swinging the hammer nice and hard, you don't really feel the weight of the hammer, but when you're trying to, you know, you're trying to like, you know, give it some, you then start to feel the weight of the hammer. Do I have Nutella on my face? No. Okay, good, thank you. Not yet. Just wait a few minutes. <laughs> Okie doke. So I just stepped it down to a three and a half pound hammer there. Took a little, uh, little, little, little less weight and it made it very nice. So thank you all so much. Oh, here we go. Warrior Maiden comments. The best ever crepes are done with a light layer of Nutella and thinly sliced banana. You didn't like the I didn't like the ones with banana? Okay. So I probably wouldn't like the ones with banana and Nutella. Thank you for the suggestion to everybody else. I hope you try that one too. Hope you try that one too. You like them with bananas? Okay, there was somebody's comment that I wanted to reply to. Samson Fulmer 
Thank you very much for the 10 bucks. I appreciate that. If you hack a broke, you don't need to send that, and, and that's very kind of you. But he asked, what refractory KO will do you use? Because I accidentally melted my refractory in KO will. This refractory is from, oh boy, High Temp Tools. H-I-G-H Temp Tools dot com. Uh, they're based here in the US. They sell the refractory that we use listed as medium density castable, I believe. And the KO wool underneath that refractory is just their one inch 2700 degree or 2800 degree KO wool, maybe. I think it's their 2800 degree KO wool. I don't know. You should be able to get away with 2600 degree KO wool, provided you've got a thick enough layer of that medium density refractory. Da -da 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 -da. Starting to look like a pair of tongs, I dare say. Bowser. I'm going to grab a tape measure, folks. See if I need to draw these out some more. I'll see if I'm going to be happy with that length. Something that I find very easy to do when, I am, uh, when I'm making a pair of tongs, and I'm making it in this manner where I'm making both halves attached at the hip, where to be cut in half, like a pair of Yeah, I'm just going to stop my train of thought. So this is 30 inches long, which means that when I cut it in half, we're going to have a 15 inch long pair of tongs. Let's have a look at these ones. OK. Well, these ones, which are some of my most used pairs of tongs, I think I made these when I was probably 13. These ones are 12 inches long. So we're going to have an extra three inches on those bad boys. Well, inch and a half on either end. That's pretty good. But we might just thin this out a little more in that middle section. Just because we can. Because I just don't want this live stream to end. Moderation? What's that? I think we do this to the point of just utter exhaustion. So we'll draw it out a little bit more. Go a little further. I like a, a light pair of tongs, light whippy pairs of tongs. You know what? I don't think this should be about what I like in a pair of tongs. I think we should give these tongs away. And I think we've got some incredibly good candidates for folks to give tongs to. So we're going to be giving these tongs away. I don't have the mental acuity right now and decision making at this altitude. I'm hypoxic. Probably the carbon monoxide buildup from the forge. I shouldn't make light of that. Carbon monoxide buildup is extremely serious. Have a carbon monoxide detector in your workshop, please. But I haven't worked out exactly who we're going to give them away to, because we have an incredible number of people who have donated to this stream and given us money. And I feel like it should be them. Unless it should be somebody that's, you know, maybe kind of up and coming and getting into it who needs a good set of tongs. I can't quite. There's a whole lot of ideas. Maybe you folks in the comments could let us know. How should we decide who we give these tongs away to? because we need to give these tongs away. On an unrelated note, I would also like to let everybody know. A little promotion we're running. Oh, you thought you could get away from a salesman steal quite that easily. Hop on a little live stream and get away from the man with the ads. No. What am I doing? This is terrible. It's not how you be friends with people. <laughs> wow. Anyway, I was just basically going to say this. I'll keep it nice and simple. Salesman Steel will depart after this to just the beginning minute and last minute of an episode of a normal video. Salesman Steel will return then um, after a quick entry now. Oh my goodness. Salesman Steel did a bad job today. Okay, I'm going to be right back, folks. Oh, oh! Salesman Steel, Salesman Steel. Let's go. Come on. Where is that thing? Oh, my goodness gracious me. Oh. Have, you, have, you, have you seen the patch? Oh, I know where I left it. Probably somewhere reasonable. Oh. Oh. I had the, I had, I had that little PVC patch somewhere. And then I put it somewhere, thinking I put it in a really smart place. Well, you know what, folks? 
Ah, oh, I found it. Okay. I was about to have to describe this offering, which would have been really bad. This here is one of our PVC patches. They are, if I may say so, awesome. They have one of these things, which means you can stick this, staple it, glue it on something, and then this one is Velcro, and so you can put that on, you can put it on a backpack, put it in a truck, wherever you want, PVC patch, touch mark, all of this. Well, you can get one of these for free! You can get one of these for free, but it's, I mean, in typical salesman fashion, I'm about to make it a whole lot less exciting. You can get it for free by buying anything on the website today. So buy anything on the website, we'll give you one of these for free. You need to buy a t-shirt, buy a hat, whatever you want. The, uh, the way to make it happen on the website is you add whatever you want to buy to your cart, and then you add this to your cart, PVC Velcro patch, the PVC Velcro patch should come up as a 100% discount. If it doesn't, that's my fault. It's a weekend and I didn't bother uh, the team member who actually does that stuff to do it. I did it myself, which means I could have easily made a mistake. Let me know if it did make a mistake. It shouldn't though. So buy anything, get a free PVC patch. So there'll be a fun little thing to do. Okay. Salesman Steel is out of the building. It's back to just having a good old time. If you want to support the show, oh my goodness, I'm Salesman Steel is right back. If you want to support the show, feel free to buy a t-shirt, something like that, anything you want. Get yourself a free PVC patch. We'll send it out from right here at the workshop. Okay. Salesman Steel sure now has to make a scene. Good crepes, such good crepes. Okay, you guys rock. I just feel so grateful, all these incredible comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, okay, let's read some more. Oh, awesome. Sean Harmon from Australia, moving to Canada soon. Recently started knife making because of watching the videos. That makes me so happy. He's a farrier, which is awesome. It's a, you know, a cousin craft to, to the blacksmithing and knife making crafts. And I just have the utmost respect for horseshoes. I'm very grateful to hear that, you know, we helped get you hooked on knife making, Sean. That is incredibly exciting, and I hope you enjoy moving to Canada. I think you're going to have a great time. Da -da 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 A little bit more tweaking and polishing. We'll be almost there, folks. Surely good. So it's getting a little toasty again. But it's all going to be okay. Cooling it off. Back in the fire we go. Oh. Standing by a forge gets you a little warm. Thank you, Sean, again. Lovely message. Tim Wambick. Tim Wambick. Bought the beginner's guide to blacksmithing from you three years ago. Never got to afford the tools to make tools. Wanna to email us, support at Forge Steel. Tim, I'm gonna hook you up with a great deal on that. Thank you for the hundred dollars. I sincerely appreciate it. Support a Forge deal, payment confirmation. Let us know you brought the beginning blacksmithing uh, course and you're interested in the tools to make tools one. We will hook you up. 
Oh, and we brought our anvil out two days after he bought his, so sorry. I apologize, but I'm, I'm sure the anvil you bought is gonna be good and it's gonna, it's, you're gonna have a good time with it, you know? I, I wanna make sure, you know, when I started that video, which I hope you've watched, announcing this anvil, I was trying to be very intentional in announcing it by showing you that you could take $20 at four by six and some super glue and make stuff. I.e., I wanna let you all know that you don't have to spend lots of money with us to be able to get into this craft. I don't want this to be an inaccessible craft. I want to be able to help inspire you, offer great things if you're willing to spend for great things, but also offer the alternatives that can get you by otherwise. And so, to be completely frank, because I don't want to be in the business of you know, letting you know the charade that everything that we have is the best there is, because so much of it is subjective. And to say this is the best anvil in the world, I couldn't say that with a straight face. I don't know if it's the best anvil in the world. You know, from my subjective opinion, this meets the points that I wanted in an anvil, and so we made it, we made it into that. You're gonna have a great time with whatever anvil you buy. You're gonna have a great time when you buy a piece of mild steel and start hammering away on it. There's so much that you can do on a piece of mild steel, and any anvil that you buy is gonna serve you very well. It's just like anything. A car is gonna get you from A to B no matter what it is. Whether it is, you know, a $500, $500 junker, it's gonna get you from A to B. Whether it's slightly more comfortable, it's 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, or whether it's a Ferrari, you're gonna get from point A to point B. A whole lot of this stuff is about feeling, it's about the fine details, and it's about marginal gains. When you want the feeling of working on you know, an anvil that has some of the details that I cared about, then it's the time to step up to this. When you want the, what I consider marginal gains that this anvil gives, then it's time to step up to it. But I don't want everybody to think that you have to have this anvil to make things. It's just not the case. You can get by with a whole lot less. I'm not making this anvil just because I'm making it so we can put these cool features on there, like holes in the feet, flush logos, an inch hardy hole, five eighths hardy hole, you know, not oversized, not undersized, really nice horn controlling the edges. Well, all of this stuff is all really important, but you can survive with a whole lot less. And I want that to be the message of what we put out as much as possible. You don't need all of this. We have it because we enjoy this like a whole lot of you enjoy having nice tools. And because it affords us marginal gains, which are important to the business, doesn't mean that you need it. Will's videos are so incredible. Those videos as of late from, him, from his home workshop are such an incredible resource for those of you that are getting into this craft, you're making progress, you wanna know what is the standard you can set to yourself? Look at how incredible the work that Will produces is. And I hope that that helps you realize that, well, actually, there are very few limits on what you can achieve with the tools that you already have. It's so much more about practice, uh, you know, dedication, devotion, research, education, than it is about the tools that you have. I'm rambling. I'm done. Got this drawn out. It's now time to get ready to punch a hole here in the boss. Da 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 da. Wesley Jackson, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased you like watching the channel. It means a whole lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you. William Owen, thank you so much. He asked about a Damascus steel low angle jack plane blade. He's a woodworker, loves watching us make things. I really appreciate that, William. You know, it's, it's really difficult for us to take on commission work. It's generally not something that we do. We're always open to the idea. Um, but I, I don't think the time is right right now for us to take on any commission work. We have so much to finish off, so many big projects to work on that feel like we might end up. I don't think it's gonna work out. So I appreciate it, but I don't think we're gonna be able to take on any commission work. It's the long and short of it. Thank you though. What's my opinion of a railroad track anvil? for a very beginner metal pounder. My opinion, absolutely. Yes, railroad track anvil, great. 
No problem at all, that's how I started. You can start making some stuff. The downsides to a railroad track anvil, railroad track is not flat across the top. So you need to flatten it off somehow. Use a grinder, you know, go to a friend that has a mill or something. Um, that's the downside, you don't have a horn, etc., etc. If I had a preference, I would just take a big chunk of steel. Big chunk of mild steel, I'd be happier with that than I would a railroad track. Um, that would make me, make me feel good. So yeah, if you can flatten off the top of a railroad track, you're gonna be having a good time. You know, you won't have a horn, but you can get around that. Okay, so I'm trying to bring this in here so we get a little better clearance for the other jaw. I'm trying to taper this jaw out some. I feel like I didn't take as much material as I had on the last one. Whoa, and I miss hit and hit the anvil. I didn't take as much material as I did on the other jaw. So it's really not gonna be quite even, unfortunately. That's what I get, I'm out of practice, so that stuff happens. Okie dokie, let's get ready to punch a hole. We'll mark it at this low temperature after cooling off the bar. Christ Centered Ironworks, how are you? He has a YouTube channel, folks, check him out. Christ Centered Ironworks, I, I recognize your name and recognize your face. Now that you're stateside, Alec, do you have any plans on attending some blacksmith conferences? Quad State is a good one in Troy, Ohio, in September that about 1,200 smiths attend. Do I have any plans? Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to minimize the, the amount of events that I schedule myself for. I'm trying to go easy on that, so I really don't overcommit myself. I struggle enough as it is meeting the level of productivity that I want to meet in the workshop, but traveling for a whole lot of things becomes difficult. So I don't really have any plans to go to, to, go to any events. I can't think of a whole lot on my mind. Not, uh, not in the plans right now. What's up? Bound video settings. It, it, is, it, is it working okay? Are, pe are people saying there are problems? Does it look fine if you look there? So I think we're okay. I mean, it looks like a nice resolution. Looks like folks are enjoying it. No, I, I feel like I remember things like that where it would say bad video settings, but it's actually okay. And it's still working. So, so long as it's still working and it's working, I'm, I'm happy. All right, let's punch a hole. So again, we start with the jaw facing down. Come into about the middle of the boss. Hit once, take it out. Why do I like to hit once and take it out? Well, oh, I just hit my hand. This is again, like this is part of my education with Ryan Brazil. And I, and, and I really like hitting once before taking it out because it, affords me a lot more control. I can look at what I'm doing, observe the progress I'm making, and make incremental adjustments as I work, which is incredibly important to me. Uh, a lot of folks, they'll put their punch in the hole and they'll start going, they'll go one, two, three, you know, bam, 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 they'll take it out. That's fine. If that's how you want to work, there are some downsides to it. You can damage your tool a little more easily because your tool is going to be heating up more because it's stuck in there conducting heat. You can also go off center and end up two blows further than you would have been otherwise. You're also having to work at a little bit of like a faster, more energized pace, which can be tiring, you know? If, if you were doing this all day, and you're going bam, 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 and then take it out, you know, it's a little more of an exertion than just going a little bit slower but maybe even getting it done in the same amount of time because you're not spending as much time cooling the tool. So it paces myself a little bit nicer. It means I don't go off course as much. A lot of folks do just fine hitting three times with the punch uh, and then taking it out. But if I was a beginner, I'd find it easier to just hit once, take it out. Especially if I didn't have the best steel for my punches because they'd be more liable to be distorting. And so if you don't have the best uh, you know, hot work steel for a punch, it's really good to take it out, make sure you don't damage it quite as easily. Okay.
Awesome. Brad Miller, thank you so much. I'm very pleased for the, for the, for the hundred bucks. It means a lot. The hundo, really pleased. He, uh, he's got into blacksmithing after watching the videos. That just gets me so happy. It makes me so happy. In older videos, you advise using a striking anvil out of three inches of soft steel. Will we be making those? The idea is in my head. I've been thinking about getting a quote for getting a pattern made from our founders that make these anvils, getting them to make us an unhardened striking anvil. And I, uh, that, that's in my head. I want to make that happen. So stay tuned, because I want to make that happen. And I have a feeling it might be quite cost effective to do the striking anvils. We had looked into doing, uh, some folks have asked, Alec, are you going to do different weights of anvil? You have the 140 pounder, this one. Are you going to do a smaller one, a bigger one? I'm not sure. It really depends on uh, the market demand. It depends how many people like this, whether it's worth us getting a new pattern made. This, so the, the way it works when you cast something out of steel, you go to a, a founder, you have to have your CAD file, your com computer-aided design file, I believe is probably what, it's, what it is. Can you hear my voice is going? <laughs> you have your CAD file, and then you go to the foundry. And they quote on making a pattern, which is the wooden part that they put in the sand, compress the sand around, open up the sand, pull the wooden piece out. That wooden part needs to get made and it needs to be designed in a way that it helps all the stuff flow, it helps the molds release. There's a whole lot that goes into designing that part right. And so, making that pattern is really expensive, basically. It, it, it's very, very expensive to just simply make the pattern alone. So bringing other weights of anvils in is a tricky one because there's a lot of upfront cost before we even factor in the cost of actually melting the steel and manufacturing an anvil. So we've got to see how this works. It's a little bit of a gamble. You know, if only uh, 10 folks want to buy anvils, I don't think it's going to work out so well for us to, to, to make this move with the business. Hopefully a whole lot more of you want anvils. That's the dream and the hope. You know, the, the key upfront cost of the pattern has been swallowed, and so, you know, invariably, it's just a, just a question of how does that all go with market demand. So, roundabout way of answering, yes, I want to do some striking anvils. We haven't done enough of that type of work since I've been in the U.S. You know, we've, we've really, like a lot of those, like, back to basics things, or it's not even back to basics, but a lot of those things that formed the beginning of my career, and, and education in blacksmithing have kind of a little bit been left by the wayside as the busyness of moving and all the exciting projects have come into the forefront. And I want to do some more struck projects with a striker and get back to those roots. You know, I don't even have my anvil bolted down. It's hot glued to the, to the concrete. It's ridiculous. You know, I need, to, I need to get myself in shape there, do some work with a sledgehammer, get some striking anvils made, get mine mounted here, um, and, and start doing some work with sledgehammer because that is just so much fun. It is unbelievable. So, yes, I want to work on that. Right, let's get some more of your questions. Fellow folks, you lovely people. Goodness gracious, I feel so grateful. Thank you all so much. All righty. Lou Stenku. Just want to say I'm working on my first pair of tongs and I'm watching a pro. Puts it in perspective that I'm not doing too bad for an amateur with an improvised workspace. Thank you for you, all you teach in your videos. That makes me happy. I, I really appreciate it. So, thank you, Lou. I'm very pleased you're making a pair of tongs. I am, it makes me so happy to hear you guys getting out in your workshops and making stuff. That is what it is all about. All right, let's see if we can make these things match a little better. Dum, da, da, dum, 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 dum. Oh, I can't stand on that. I'm too small. This anvil, compared to the last anvil that was on this stand, so this is an 11 inch high anvil. The last anvil was nine and a half inches high. So it's an inch and a half higher than the last anvil I had on it. So I've got to kind of do a little uh, re-getting used to. 
a little re-getting used to. Because it's a little higher up than normal. Which leads us to a question that I'm sure a whole lot of you have. What height should I have my anvil? Oh! I'm not high enough up. I felt the consequences. Ow! A little reverberation, if you uh, understand what I'm saying. That is the... You've got to be careful when you have a piece of steel between your legs. Okay, enough talk of that. <laughs> you kind of zinged me. So, how high should you have your anvil? Uh, it depends on the work that you're doing, what the bulk of the work that you're doing is going to be, how you feel, all of that. Just like anything, you know, it's a whole lot of variables. Generally, for most work, if you can hold a piece of steel between your legs and the steel is parallel, you're going to be good to go. The trouble is, if you see, you, you can see here, I hold this between my legs, it's not parallel. If I hit that, I'm going to have an unfortunate time. This is a little bit high for me. This is higher than I would like. If I was doing lighter work, glorious, because you don't have to bend down as much while you're doing the, 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 the lighter hammering. But if you're trying to wail away and you're making drifts and stuff, you're going to want a lower anvil because you want to get some more, some more air time with the hammer, get some more gravity on it. It's going to help you have a better time. For most people, their anvil heights you know, tend to be in this range. I'm not the tallest person in the world by any stretch of the imagination. Depending on how self-important I am on the day, I might be 5'7 or 5'9, who knows? 32 inches right here. It's a 32 inch anvil height. The last one, therefore, would have been blah 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 maths. Duh, 30 and a half inch. 30 and a half inches. Oh boy. I think 30 and a half inches. And that suited me fine as somebody in that broad spectrum. This tends to be an okay kind of height, 32 inches. You know, if you're an average height kind of person, 32 inch anvil, you know, it's a little too tall for me, might be good for you. So try that out, see if that works. People do things like saying, you know, Stand up straight and feel your knuckles on the anvil. That's kind of close. It might be a little bit high, though, you know, because I find this anvil's on the touch on the high side, and I can barely graze my knuckles. You'll work it out. A little experimentation. You'll work it out. You'll have a good time. I'm just so unfocused on this work piece. I've just been, like, talking, and then I'm like, oh, there we go, I did some work. <laughs> Let me ramble a little bit. Eat a crepe. I'm a blacksmith, look at me. Wow. <laughs> mm -mm. I made not oh. I forgot to drift it before I put the touch mark in. Christ centered iron worked. Who else would like to see a collaboration between Alec and Joey Vandersteg making some anvils on the big hammer in the background? I would like to see that collaboration. It'd be a ton of fun. And Joey and I might have already talked about how practical it would be with such a large forge like that to make an anvil under such a large power hammer. I'd love to make a, like, you know, make an actual, like, 20 pound, 50 pound anvil. That'd be incredible. Thank you all so much. Felix, the Cat 5 e Gaming, thinks I'm drunk. Wow, I'm not drunk. I'm very far from it. A little embarrassing, isn't it, when your completely uninebriated state is assumed to be drunk. Oh boy, I should work on that.
So, drifting. Do this. Yo. Hi ho, hi ho. It's in the hole we go. A little bit of drifting, a little bit of drifting, drifting, I owe. I shall leave the drift in there while it cools. Yes, 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 I shall indeed. As the steel shrinks, it will cool. As it cools, it shall shrink, rather. And as it shrinks, it shall cool. And so by putting the drift in there, as it's cooling, we can, you know, hopefully make sure it doesn't shrink up too much. Folks, it's about time for us to cut this in half. Unbelievable. So far we have come. How long has this been streaming for? Because I remember when I used to do these, I'd like look at the clock and then it's like three hours had gone by. Two hours? I'm pretty sure Brian used to make a pair of tongs in like, or he can make a pair of tongs in like 45 minutes. He probably wasn't talking and probably wasn't acting like a fool the whole time, so that would do it. I'm not a fool, that's very kind, very kind. Okie dokie. Righty-o. It's time for us to make a mark on where the middle is. After pancakes. All right. How are you doing retro? Oh. Okay. I can't eat and talk. That's so rude, especially on a live stream. I'm so sorry, guys. Oh my goodness. You spend a year and a half off her, her Majesty's Island and, you know, look what happens. 28 and a half inches divided by two. Eleven and three quarter inches it is. All righty. I think I can use a sharpie for it. A little warmer. Okay, I'll open the door. Oh, it's glorious. Look good. Great. So what did I say? Eleven and three quarter inches. No, it was 13 and a quarter, there we go. Where did I take my measurement from? You look at the mountains? Don't they look good? Folks. Montana is very underwhelming. I don't recommend it. The views, frankly, meh to middling. Wouldn't recommend it, guys. Okie dokie. Double check that. That'll do. That'll do. All right. They're saying 14 and a quarter. 14 and a quarter times two isn't 28 and a half. What are they talking about?
It's fine. Oh, that camera just died. We'll switch to the other one. It's fine. It's just that it was very loud, and it made me think about the fact that I'm going to be going deaf, and so I should put hearing protection on. What? Ah, she says you are going deaf, that is. So everybody here saying, oh, I'm already deaf. So to those of you that said, oh. Well, I, I was hoping it would balance. You're right. I got a static shock from that earlier too. I was hoping it would balance and then it would, it would be, a, it was a joke, it was meant to be funny. But you know what happens when you try to be funny. <laughs> Right, so we're going to cut this. OK, well, you know what else we're doing? We're testing an anvil, for goodness sake. Please, if you buy one of our anvils in the future, don't cut with it. An anvil is not a cutting instrument. It is a, an anvil. It is for hammering hot steel on. It's not for hammering cold steel on. But I'm here to test it. And judging by the state of my beard, it should be clear that I'm a reckless 16-year-old with no desire to listen to mature advice, such as that of not cutting cold metal with an anvil. OK, so I'm having a look at it, and I'm seeing what effect that had on the edge. You know, I'm cutting a piece of work-hardened cold metal using this sharp edge. And frankly, it looks OK. It looks really good. It's not rolling. I'm not seeing any chipping. It looks just as sharp as anywhere else. So that's good. So this achieves a cold cut. Um, by nicking the metal like this, which I hope you can see, it means that as we bend it, we can concentrate the stress and exert so much force over such a small amount of material that it breaks right in half. And would you look at that? To everybody said that my maths were wrong. I think that's uh, I think that's pretty close. Right, so that will cool off, and while it does, we will proceed to some riveting. Let's do this. We need to make a rivet. Now, you might be familiar with the Eiffel Tower. It's in Paris, Texas. It was riveted together in the 1800s. And because it's in Texas, you know it's the largest one in the world. What's that? Well, we're going to do similar kind of rivets. What's up? They're not forgiving me for what? For my math? I just said math instead of maths. I said math. I know. It's happening. Assimilation. Right here. So we're going to be making a rivet, much like the rivets that hold together the Leaning Tower of Pisa, this is what we're going to be doing. We need to take a measurement of the width of this. Um, I'm going to heat up a little bit too much. Okay, I'm going to pull that out of the fire and concentrate a little bit here. So as I said, Colosseum held together with rivets. Fascinating stuff. Uh, it's incredible the technology that they used, you know, even as most recently as the... I mean, for goodness sake, there's so much stuff that's put together with rivets, even more recently than when they riveted together the Colosseum. So there's a lot to uh, talk about when it comes to rivets. But when they used it to put together the Great Wall of China, they were using it for its compressive nature. A rivet, it's essentially a bar of steel with an upset and squished overhead on one side, upset, squished overhead on the other side. You heat it up, and it's cool, you know, when they were building all those incredible structures, they'd have a guy with a hand crank rivet forge, very small forge, way up high there on, uh, on the Burj Khalifa, and he had, 
you know, rivets that had one head already made, and he'd be heating them up in the coal, and they did it a few different ways. Sometimes he'd hold it in a pair of tongs and whoosh, throw it up to the folks above them. Sometimes, I think they generally did go with the tongs. And then up top, there'd be a guy with a cone or a really heavy, heavy glove who would catch it, then take it, put it inside a hole, and then there'd be guys with a sledgehammer and more recently with pneumatic tools heading over that second head. And then as it shrank, the steel would contract and the two formed over heads would be pinching the material together, holding it with a great degree of force. Now, we're going to be using a rivet not for its ability to hold something together tight, but simply for its ability to have two heads that hold these pivoting pieces captive so that you can move freely without coming loose, as opposed to using a nut and a bolt where the, uh, the, the bolt could come loose, the nut could come loose with the bolt from it being worked. So it's wonderfully, uh, wonderful technology, old stuff. Energy her. Take a measurement here, very unprecisely. I want to tell you a little, a little more of uh, Mr. Steele's mathematic skills. So, we are dealing with. I think it's about right. Half an inch of material. Those two pieces are a half inch. That is right. The end of this ruler is, is weird. Those, uh, those two pieces are half an inch long together. We have a piece of quarter inch round mild seal bar in the fire. So, just to put it into perspective for you metric viewers, that's my homage to the metric system. 12 millimeters, we have a six millimeter piece of steel. <coughs> Well, we need one and a half times the diameter of the rivet shaft material to make an appropriate rivet head, which means if we're using quarter inch bar, we need quarter divided by two is an eighth, eighth plus a quarter, three eighths of an inch of material either side, three eighths times two is six eighths, which is three quarters plus a half, which is an inch and a quarter. <coughs> if you metric folk can't follow, goes a little like this, six millimeter round bar, half a six is three. Da -da 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 -da. Six plus three is nine, nine times two is 18. 12 plus 18 is a number that's too high for me to actually count to, so I'll let your calculators sort that one out yourself. We will give it a brush, give it a brush, give it a brush, yes, we will. Da -da 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 -da. These holes are actually a little bit tight. It's a little bit of a, a little bit of tricky one. They actually need opening up some more. So, make a plan of action for that. It's not wide enough. So I'll put this in the fire. Oh, and uh, we could do it the reasonable and mature way. Or we can do it the lazy way. Right, a little bit of pancake, bear with me, and then I will keep rambling shortly. rest my vocal cords here a little bit. Thank you for your patience.
All right. What is a lazy fix? Well, I did use that nice drift. Well, I'm now just going to take a punch. Lazy fix. Ta-da! Do the lazy fix. Oh, the lazy fix. Lazy fix into my heart. You do the lazy fix and you lazy fix. Lazy fix. You do the lazy fix. Lazy. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Gotta keep the viewers. All right. Hurrah! Capamo! Do 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 da 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 a window shades up too, and uh, we'll uh, be circling into uh, Tongville in about the next 20 minutes or so with a completed uh, pair of tongs. The weather is currently uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Beside the forge, it's about a billion degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, we've almost got a pair of tongs finished. I almost finished something. <laughs> it's a little too late. <laughs> yeah, past the bedtime, that's for sure. So, fellow people of the interwebs, listen up. We've got a hole. We have here a plate of steel that happens to be how thick might you be wondering? Well, three eighths of an inch thick, and you'll remember that number from earlier. Because earlier, I mentioned that a quarter plus an eighth was three-eighths of an inch, and that is exactly the measurement that is on either side of these two pieces of material to make a rivet head. And so, we will hold these here. We've got a hot rivet. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Hot rivet goes into the hole. Oh my goodness. Get in there. Hot rivet breaks off into the cool tank. Steals the show with its awesome noise. Head of rivet gets hammered and it doesn't look like it's working well. Something looks off. I think that's a half inch thick instead of three eighths of an inch thick. Or I don't know how to measure with the ruler. The idea is you don't be me and you make things work right. The idea is, is you head one rivet at a time. Well, I'm a nincompoop, so I don't get to do that. I now have to fiddle with it and head both at the same time. Rats. Okay, folks. Okay. Let's fix this. How about we? I need a monkey tool. I think I left all my monkey tools in England. How else can I do this? Aha! A bolt head. These two halves of the tongs are not sitting flush. So I'm taking this bolt head. I'm just gonna give it one big uh, quickity quickity whack. Whoop! And now we're gonna heat it up and just hammer the thing shut. It's just extremely loud, and I remembered as I dropped it and the noise filled and echoed around my head that I hadn't put hearing protection on. Me, dehydrated? What are you talking about? Okie dokie. All righty folks. Could I ask a small favor? Could I have a little bit of water, please? Thank you so much. I have hearing protection on now, folks. 
we're ready to go. Uh, Jim Link has asked, what is our gas bill? Well, I actually haven't received the first gas bill from when we had the natural gas forge installed. But it doesn't really matter because it's not representative of forging every single day because we don't forge every single day right now. And there's been a lockdown. Barely any work has got done. So gas bill right now is not going to be too high. In the future, it will be higher. Uh, to put into perspective, when working When working off of one of those big propane tanks that we use, those, uh, is it a 100 gallon propane tank? Thank you so much, 100 pound propane tank maybe. Um, we get a few days of work out of one of those. You know, so we'd change two, in a week's forging, we'd go through two bottles pretty easily. Which means that in a week's forging on propane, you can be spending, depending on how expensive it is, where you buy it, you know, with a forge this size, running it all the time for a week, like we sometimes do, you might spend uh, 120 bucks, something like that. Okay, got it uh, thing ma -duded. We done thing ma -dood it It hath been thing ma -dood. riveted. Wow, I'm tired, folks. Thank you, Doki. Jolly good. Just gonna clean this all up. Right, so then going to come here, straighten that a little bit. You will see, if you're a keen observer, the ends of this are not flush. I need to file on them. So I will file on them. Vice. Bum ba da bum. And I'm gonna grab a grab a ah! drink. It's doing great. Here we go. That horrible. Oh boy. I don't have a rust. Nasty. I, you know, this would be faster with an angle grinder. Is that an angle grinder? On the wall. Okay. Right. Okie doke, folks. Bad example. I have a grinding room. I'm also lazy. And I also have the ability to hold my breath for a good number of seconds. Up really nice. So we have the front side of the tongs pretty much sorted. We just need to get them all bent and looking nice and then loosen them up because they're still tight. <coughs> now basically everything you see here is stuff that I learned from Brian Brazil. You know, and it's I generally don't consider what we do to be making a whole lot of educational content because a lot of the time we don't know what we're doing um, because you know we haven't had instruction. I haven't had instruction on it. 
but like, you know, I learned how to make this from Brian Brazil. And those little tricks, like adjusting them while they're locked up, uh, picked up from him. Righty ho. Righty ho. So that's looking quite neat. What I'm going to now do is we're going to open them up. So if you have a pair of tongs and you rivet them and they're stuck, oh my goodness, no, what am I going to do? That's fine. Take a chill pill, dog. You're going to be fine. Wow. Really not helping with the whole Alex drunk thing, are we? Back here. Wow. Holy moly, so many comments. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Go home, Scott. You're drunk. Did you just see that one? <laughs> the best. The best. Hi, Alec. Why do you brush the scale off the metal with that wire brush? Well, So, you put it in the forge, it heats up. The forge, it's a hot place, and hot things generally react faster than cold things. And so, when a piece of steel is out in the atmosphere, it's picking up oxides, and it's forming iron oxide. Well, here it forms it super duper fast. And this iron oxide coats the surface, and it becomes scale, as you know. But if you hammer on that, it doesn't become part of the metal. All that happens is, is it hammers into the metal and then it either sticks in there or eventually it breaks off and it leaves a mark where it lived because it doesn't become homogenous with the metal again. So I brush the scale off because I want to get it off the surface before I hammer it into the surface where though it won't homogenize and become one, I hope I'm using the right words, I'm not sounding stupid, it does have the opportunity to leave a dent when you hammer on it. And then if you just leave it all there, it looks nasty when you're done. And so you want to clean that scale up. So you saw that? I took a heat right at the end. And if your tongs are built with a geometry that includes a proper reverse taper, meaning that in this cross section of the tongs, the thickest area is right here by the boss, right here by the boss. If they're constructed like this, Similarly in this direction, thickest area is the pivoting area. You're gonna be able to heat them up, have them hot, and open them up, and the point of least resistance is gonna be the rivet, and you won't bend your reins. And so you can open them up without bending your reins, but loosening the rivet. And so that's a good tell for if you've got your geometry constructed in line with this, you know, because they'll open up nice and easy. So that's a, that's a, that's a good, good reference there. It's important that that's the thickest up right there, so you don't have binding issues. What? Welcome to the Alex Steel ASMR show. Oh, I could hold people ransom. Buy something, or I will keep. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm done. Sorry, it's too late. I'm not speaking sense here. But if you buy something, you will get a free PVC patch. <gasps> Jolly good. Righty ho. Fabulous. It's a little squeaky. I think I've had some tricks for this in the past. Tricks up my sleeve. Let's see if I can dig them out of the 1800s. This is a pot of beeswax. Don't you be too nosy. That's none of your beeswax. That's my beeswax. Okay, fine. I'll tell you. There is a secret ingredient within, and that is gr I've got something more special. What's up? I've got something more special. I have a new product that I've been wanting to try. This isn't how you actually use this product, so this is not what it's meant to be, but I think uh, 
Stealing a little drop of it would be just fine. This is punch lube for blacksmithing. And it is called... How do I pull this one off? You know what? I don't think I need to say what it's called. It's all good. It is punch lube, specifically for lubricating your punch as you are punching holes, lubricating your drift as you are drifting holes and enlarging them. And this is meant to be the bee's knees, the best lube there is um, for blacksmithing. It's called, as I said, not going to say it. That would be inappropriate. But it's incredibly helpful. It's, uh, it's meant to be the stuff. It's meant to be the stuff. Don't get this on your skin, though. Probably would not be good. So, 4G's is a non-toxic solution designed for industrial use. While non... Oh, it does say non-toxic. Okay. So, let's open this up. This isn't the way you use it. Caveat, 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 caveat. But it's designed to lubricate at high temperatures, so I figure I was about to put some beeswax with graphite on these pairs of tongs. And I thought, you know what? Might as well uh, put a little uh, industrial lube on there instead. And that's how we got this demonetized. I said lube way too many times. I didn't say the name of this, though, which is impressive, right? Righty ho, so I'll put a little drop of that on there, maybe. That's not gonna work. There we go. It's meant to be dissolved in water, but I haven't done that, have I? Sorry? It's, it's very thick. It's, uh, you're meant to dissolve it in water, but I... Uh, okay, I'm gonna get a little, little cup. I want to, the aim is I want to pour this lube over that joint to lubricate it. I was going to put that, dra that, that beeswax and graphite in there, and that's worked quite well for me in the past. But clearly, I'm not content with this just being a two-hour live stream. I want this to be a four-hour live stream. So I want to just waste a little bit more of your time unnecessarily. So. Ta -da 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 -da. A little bit of water. And a little bit of lube. Dilute with water before use. Interesting. Water soluble. We will mix it up. And then get a little bit of lube on our tongs. This looks so bad. It, like, I mean, it's just messy with that, with that lube. I've made a right mess, so. There we go. Terrible. Perfect. I just wanted that. Smells really good, too. Good. OK, lovely. Now we have this disgusting white coating all over our tongs. So it's designed for lubricating punches and drifts while punching or enlarging holes. It's not designed for lubricating a pair of tongs, for goodness sake. So sorry, still loud. You know it would be a really original idea? Oil. It's fine. I'm not going insane. I'm not going insane. How long was Alec lubricating his pair of tongs for? 45 minutes with 9,000 people watching. He lubricated his tongs for how long? Who would have thought? Oil <laughs> lubricates really well, guys. What? No. 
It was very bright when we started this. <laughs> Okie doke. I know. So, we've learned, ladies and gentlemen, oil is just awesome. So, good, good to know. What? The smell? It's nasty. Yeah, I don't recommend that. I mean, it's frankly something that one should be very careful about in a, in a blacksmithing workshop, you know. If you're a, a parent watching this with a, with a child who is interested in this craft and wants to do it, as well as if you are yourself interested in the craft and want to do it, you've got to be careful because there's a whole lot of toxins that you can expose yourself to, like smoking oil, you know, like grinder dust. And I've not done a particularly good example of that because I ground with the angle grinder out here. Admittedly, while giving it enough time for the dust to settle, okay? I held my breath well, like a swimming champion. Which I'm not, I can't even swim. So, a little bit of oil. Blackened these up nicely, made it look good. But yeah, just basically, you gotta, you gotta be careful because smoking oil, breathing it in isn't good. You know, I backed off a little bit as it was, it was all going up there. We shall flip these around because we're not finished with the ends. What I like to do on the ends here, picked up from the man himself, Mr. Brown Brazil. I like to put a little splay out on them. Kind of means that you don't lose a hold of your tongs so much. That splay out, this is actually a pair of tongs that he made himself, and this is one of my favorite pair of tongs. That splay out is right here. We're gonna do a little bit of that, a little bit less than this. I wanna be careful with the splay that if I choose to put a tong clip on a pair of tongs, I don't need to compress them too much to get it on, but the splay out helps the tong clip stay on, one. And two, means as you're using them, you have a little bit of a reference for where the end of the tongs are. I'm gonna do a very gentle splay. And it'll go a little like this. Come over the edge here. Tiny little splay. Give him a little flatten. Oh, it's so embarrassing. They're a little bit off in length. Okay, folks, you see that? You see it? They're a little off. It's, a, it's an easy fix. I can, you know, drink, drink, drink. <clears throat> it's an easy fix. I'm gonna put this in the vice. And while you work on your vices, playing the Alex Steel drinking game, I'm gonna do some filing. I'm just gonna file that down a little bit. So get ready to hear some of the most beautiful noises in the world. Three, two, one. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine, it's not loud at all. Okie dokie, folks. How are you all doing? Thank you so much, Devlin. Thank you for your work. Works in the health field. Um, just, you know, with everything that's going on, I'm so grateful for folks that are risking their lives working on stuff. But we're not talking about that, are we? So, okay. Talk about it a little bit. I'm very grateful for everybody that is working hard and risking their lives, saving lives. That means a whole lot. And I know everybody, everybody in the comments is. And so thank you. Thank you for, for, for your lovely comment, Devon and Goody. Thank you to everybody that's watching that is, you know, working hard right now to save lives and keep people healthy and safe. It means a lot. You know, it means a lot that there are people that are willing to put their lives on the lines for others. And as a member of the general public that really doesn't do a whole lot of any sort of life-saving merit. I'm grateful that folks like you exist.
that said, it is pretty incredible, you know, the amount of life-saving I did with making this pair of tongs. Pretty impressive. Sorry? So, my lovely wife says that she thinks I need to address that I'm not actually drinking alcohol. And that I'm actually sober. Is it? Got some unfortunate news to say, folks. But despite being the name behind the Alex Steel drinking game, Chaboy is sober. Chaboy is sober indeed. This is just me. I, I am just quite weird. I don't, well, you. Normal. I think I'm normal. Special. Exactly. A little, a little, I'm a little bit out of potentially, you know, the, the normal slice of things. This is just me. Not drinking. I don't drink even. This is just me. Me and my new best friends. This is Al, yes. This is why it's confusing for you folks. This is me without editing. Exactly. This isn't actually finished. I'm in nincompoop. So, if you're curious, who is Alec without Jamie Popple, the incredible editor? It is me, weirdo extraordinaire. I'm very tired. <laughs> I'm exhausted. You know, I said before the live stream, you know, boy, this is going to be something. I'm going to be exhausted. I'm either going to sleep really well or I'm going to be so tired that I can't sleep. These things are, as they say in the home country, knackering. And that has nothing to do with knickers. I kind of get it, actually. Why would somebody mention knickers with knackering? It does sound like I am entirely inebriated. Slow nod, Mrs. Steele. Slow nod. It tells it all. It tells it all, folks. Hokely dokely. So I've got a piece of steel here. I am gonna cut it on the band saw with hearing protection. I'm gonna be right back. So you're gonna have a potentially some loud noise, unless I can find some scrap. Um, I'd like to find a little bit of scrap square steel. So when you're making a pair of tongs, folks. Oh, yes, please, and then I found a piece of scrap. We're good. When you're making a pair of, I'm sorry, I had the urge to burp, and so I had to pause there for a second. Sorry, folks. When you're making a pair of tongs, Something that you want to be really, really careful about. Be careful, some bandsaw noise is, uh, is about to occur. So you want to be really, really cautious so that you make sure this absolutely doesn't happen. You want to make sure, is, is you want to make sure that you use square for your stock, not round. So I, I hope you got that. That's my best tip of the day. I, you know, I just reiterated it for, for posterity, just in case you needed that. And yeah, that's my most important tip for when you're making pairs of tongs. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, people who are drunk burp a lot. I promise, I'm not drunk. So. Okay, what I was saying is this. When you make a pair of tongs, never make a pair of tongs. Okay, I'm speaking in absolutes here, it's probably not responsible. I don't recommend making a pair of tongs to suit round bar. Make your tongs, however, to suit square bar. Because a pair of tongs that holds square will invariably hold round. Fascinating. Just fascinating. 
So, here's what I'm doing. Making the jaws fit inwards. Hammering. Tongue's like to roll a little bit there. There we go. They fit. Now we're just final tweaks here. Brush them. It's a piece of quarter inch square, so it means they'll be good for quarter inch square. But how you set the reins is gonna depend how much smaller and larger they'll work. They've bent a little bit unevenly, so I'm gonna come around to here, straighten them a little bit. Pick this back up again. I'm just using this as my reference of what my tongue reins look like. Sighting down my reins. Hello, hello. It's a little bit bent, so we'll straighten it. What's up? Drink, yes! Okie doke. That's gonna be all she wrote. That's all she wrote. Okie doke. We're gonna brush it some more. And now we've gotta make a plan. How are we gonna give this away? Did you, did you get much feedback? Should we give it away to a donator or should we give it away like to our top donator of the day? Or should we maybe like find a way of finding somebody on Instagram that's kind of up and coming and wants a pair of tongs? Was there much feedback? Didn't catch any? So, so maybe now I brought it up, folks will reiterate their thoughts there. Um, as, as, we, as we get ready to finish off, we'll get an idea. Yeah. Let me uh, let's see if I can look at some comments from here. Bidding war accepted. Somebody says, so I've got giving it, give it to a kid starting out. Up and coming. 12 year old the board now. Somebody says top donator. Travis says he'll take it. He's got a beard that's like down here. Top don you're thinking top donator. Up and coming, up and coming. Healthcare worker. That's a good one. What are we gonna do? There's loads of good ideas. How do you pick? I that's a really good one. Shoot. Wow. Yeah? So, um, make a hashtag. Let's do hashtag Alex Steele Live. Hashtag Alex Steel Live on Instagram. If you are a young blacksmith, and you're getting into this craft, I will pick somebody who has watched this stream and is watching right now to give these to. The hashtag is Alex Steel Live. And this is the rules. The rules will go like this. Over the next few days, I want you to post some photos of your work or your forge setup. And when you do, in your caption, tag at Alex Steele, at Alex Steele Co, hashtag Alex Steele, hashtag Alex Steele Co, hashtag Alex Steele Live. And I will pick, and, I, and I'll, I'll have a look, I'll see the profiles, and I'll pick something to give a pair of tongs to. I'll get you a pair of tongs, and we'll do that. This has been a joy. Thank you all so much for watching. This is a pair of tongs and they work. I mean, what a, what a thrill. This is just the most incredible thing about making stuff is you get to go into your workshop on a Sunday evening, start with a piece of steel, you know, $3 of steel, and then finish having made something, achieved something, turn raw materials into a tool. And this is a tool, then we give it to somebody up and coming that looks like they're committed to this craft and they want to learn more. It's a tool that they might use, literally, for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Incredible.
And this is really attainable, folks. Didn't take a whole lot of tooling to make this. So I hope you all have a really great time. I hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy. It means, it means a lot to me to have uh, your support, you know, uh, watching this, you know, whether you're just viewing and, you know, you're hitting a like, uh, whether you're leaving a comment and then, of course, all the incredible donators. Thank you all so much. It means a whole lot. I'm just so grateful. And the whole team here that we're able to, well, I say here, that nobody's here right now. They're at, they're at home. But you're, you're here, of course. It's, 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 and you're grateful, too. I'm grateful. But the whole team that, you know, this business um, has working, working here is also very grateful for all your viewership and your support. So thank you all for watching. To all of you that are on the front lines right now going to war in an unconventional manner, thank you. I really appreciate that. I know the whole team here does. We appreciate that you guys are, are, are rooting for mankind and working to save lives. And so if you know somebody that's, that's working on the front lines in, in healthcare, please send them your thanks. If you are, thank you. I appreciate that. That means a whole lot to me. Thank you all for watching. Okay. I think I've used up as many thank yous as I possibly could. I feel them. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.